Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Marisa LaFleur, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Megan Margulies presenting her new book, My, Ca My Captain America, a granddaughter's memoir of a legendary comic book artist, joined in conversation by Hilary Chute. I hope you're all well and safe out there. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like this, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community, as well as our new digital community, during these unprecedented times. Every week, we will be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and also browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can click on the Q&A button that you should see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get through as many of them as time allows. Also in the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase My Captain America on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible, and help ensure the future of our landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings the last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. So we thank you for your patience and understanding on that front. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Megan Margulies is a freelance writer and essayist. Her essays have appeared in many publications, including The Washington Post, New York Magazine, and Women's Day, among many others. Her debut memoir, My Captain America, reflects on her childhood in New York City and her relationship with her grandfather, Joe Simon, who was the first editor of Timely Comics, which would later evolve into Marvel Comics, and created or co-created many iconic characters, including Captain America. Dig Boston calls My Captain America one of the summer's soaring sleeper smashes. It should fly with new and old comic heads alike. And the comic review website Panel Patter writes that readers are treated to an affectionate portrait of a man who never tired of drawing sketches for fans or talking about the iconic characters he created. If you're a fan, you start this book jealous that she grew up in the presence of a comic book legend, but you finish jealous of the close bond she had with her beloved grandfather. Megan will be joined in conversation by Hilary Chute, author and professor, professor of English and Art and Design at Northeastern University. She's also a columnist for the New York Times Book Review on comics and graphic novels, and her latest book, Why Comics, will also be linked for purchase in the chat. We're so pleased to have them both here to discuss this book tonight. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Megan and Hillary. Thank you so much. Thank you to Harvard Bookstore and thank you, Hillary, for joining me. Um, I'm gonna begin with a short reading. Uh, this is a scene from uh, a trip that we all went on, my family, and we took Daddy Joe with us. Daddy Joe is what I called my grandfather, um, which we typically did. We usually dragged him out of his apartment and made him come with us. Um, so this, this one, we are in upstate New York in Skinny Atlas. <clears throat> that week, Daddy Joe and I made it a nightly ritual to sit down by the lake with the stars bright over our heads. I squatted over the rocky shoreline breaking twigs in half, stacking everything in just the right way to make a small campfire. I ignored his concerns over my obsession with fire and lit the mound of sticks with his lighter. I loved the snap of the lighter as the flint worked to spark and the clank of the lighter's lid once the job was accomplished. Despite his concerns, Daddy Joe let me light his cigar, checking to see if it was evenly lit after a few test pulls. Once the fire was well on its way and his cigar successfully lit, he told me stories from my mom's childhood about the large houses they lived in, about the many Great Danes they raised, and of course, about Harriet, the grandmother I never met. She was a mystery to me, a missing puzzle piece to who my mom was 
and also who Daddy Joe was, this woman he'd loved and chosen as a wife. As he recounted many times before, after returning from the war in 1945, he had served with the Coast Guard on mounted beach patrol, scanning the Jersey shoreline for enemy ships from horseback. He was called into Alfred Harvey's office, Harvey, it turned out, wanted the Simon and Kirby team to join his company, Harvey Comics, the home of successful characters such as Wendy, the good little witch, and Casper, the friendly ghost. As Daddy Joe sat in the waiting room, a secretary with auburn hair seated at a desk across from him leaned over to look at his trousers. Pull up your pant leg, she ordered. What? Just pull up your pant leg, she said with a smile. Pass the knee. He pulled it up. That's good, she said, sitting back in her chair. Daddy Joe went into his meeting, but as he left, he asked her what that was about. I wouldn't go out with a guy who had white pasty legs. And that's how Daddy Joe met my grandmother, Harriet. Do I look like her? I asked him. Not really, he said, and my heart dropped. I was desperate for some sort of connection to her. If I reminded Daddy Joe of Harriet, then maybe he would love me as much as he loved her. Maybe it would make our bond even stronger, more special. You do have the same exact hair color as her though, he added. It was only hair color, but it was something. I remember sitting in the library and the librarian came up to me to let me know I had a phone call. Daddy Joe took a pull from his cigar. The librarian asked me for my autograph. I said, how do you know who I am? Turns out Harriet had called looking for Joe Simon, creator of Captain America. He laughed up to the starry sky. How long did you date Harriet until you knew you wanted to marry her, I asked. There was no dating with Harriet. If she liked you, that was it, you were hers. Maybe that was something else we had in common, my mysterious grandmother and me. I had met Daddy Joe when I was only three days old, but I guess I'd known even then that he was someone to hold on to with everything that I had. So thank you again, Hillary, for being here. And I thought it would be nice um, just for people who don't know about your work and your latest book, just to get some background about you, if you don't mind. Sure, that would that would be my pleasure. Before I start asking you, a yeah, bunch before of you start grilling me, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I'm an English professor and a professor of art and design at Northeastern, um, like Marisa said, and um, as she also mentioned, I um, write a column in the New York Times Book Review called Graphic Content. So it's a review column about comics and graphic novels. And the book review started that column in 2018. So I think it's a kind of interesting um, barometer for comics being more and more mainstream that they decided to have this column. Yep. But in terms of my own work and my own books, um, I have either written or edited six books about comics and um, my most recent one is at my feet. So I'm going to, I'm going to grab yes. it. Flash it. So, this is out in paperback as of last year. So I've written a couple of academic books on comics, and this is my first um, non-academic book on comics. It's published by Harper. It's called Why Comics from Underground to Everywhere, and it came out in paperback last year. So um, thanks to Harvard Bookstore for, for selling it tonight. And the reason it's at my feet isn't because I knew I would be um, having a chance to hold it up. It's because I was actually checking um, you know, sort of before our conversation when I was getting ready to see how many times in my book I mentioned the iconic Captain America number one cover that mm -hmm. your grandfather and Jack Kirby um, created together. Yeah. And it's three times in three different chapters. Nice. So it's in the introduction to this book, it's in the chapter <laughs> on superheroes, and it's in the chapter on war. So it's really a great um, pleasure for me to get a chance to be talking to you tonight. And I guess um, the first question that I have for you is um, why write this book now? I mean, we're at such an interesting moment. I mentioned this sort of um, barometer of the New York Times book review starting yeah. to have a column on comics and graphic novels, but you know, more broadly in mainstream culture, 
superheroes are huge. Right. Marvel is huge. Um, and this character that your grandfather, who, as you obviously mentioned, um, you called Daddy Joe, um, co-created is also huge. Um, you know, uh, a huge figure right now. So what led you to want to do this book at this moment? I think, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before that I don't think I would have been able to write this book any earlier than I did only because of my process with grief of losing him. Um, he died in 2011, which is a good amount of time ago, but it did take me a while to even be able to look at what that meant to me and even what he meant to me when he was alive. Um, you know, in publishing it during a pandemic, my first thought was this is not the greatest thing to be happening when I'm publishing my first book. But there is a part of me that was like, it's kind of perfect in a way to have a book with, you know, a glimpse of Captain America on it just because of everything he represented. And um, I know a lot of people find strengths, you know, obviously I do, but because of more personal reasons. Um, but when I see the character, it definitely gives me this feeling of safety and comfort. And I know that the character means that to a lot of fan, comic book fans as well. Right. Um, and him in general, as a person, he was just a very comforting presence for me. And I guess now might be the perfect time for <laughs> me to Some read the story, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Well, so um, I'm so interested that you brought up that process of grief because as I was reading the book, and I don't want to give too much away here, but um, so Joe Simon, your grandfather, died in 2011 at age 98. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a really, I, I think, very moving um, part of the book where you are detailing how difficult it was for you even to be around or to witness people celebrating him. Right. Like commemoration yeah. reels or, you know, adulatory yeah. articles in People Magazine that, yeah. that felt like a sort of body blow to yeah. you. Um, and so that's, that's, I guess, part of what I was interested in, sort of what was, how did that process of grief work for you where you yeah. felt like you were able to start this book? Well, it's fun, you know, when I was first dealing with the grief, I needed a moment, you know, when you're dealing with something like that, you kind of want to get away from it for a little bit. And right. I think that's one of the tricky things about losing someone who is in the public eye or whose creation is in the public eye, uh, because you can't really get that. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the People magazine. It's like, I was trying to treat myself to like a pedicure. So, you know, I was like, I'm going to take a moment for myself. And I'm looking through this magazine, just looking to lose myself in stupid celebrity gossip. And I see it and it's just like a punch in the gut. So at first it was very difficult, but then as time went on, I started to find um, a lot of comfort in it because I realized that there's this huge community of people who respect him and love the work that he has done and it it has formed more into a comfort thing so now when I see you know a Captain America t-shirt or something it's no longer like oh my god he's gone it's he's here like it's right. sort of like my sighting of him right. and you know I like to think he's looking over me and that's sort of like him being like hey I'm still here Right. Um, but also just like to n see that people are still loving the character, which is amazing how many years later, it's like almost 80 years now or more than that. Um, and it's really comforting to know that he's not, the character isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, right. Um, so, I mean, if you're looking for Captain America t-shirts, you must see a, a lot of them. Um, yeah. 
And I guess one thing that your comments um, brought up for me that I, I really appreciate about your book is as a person who studies comics and comics culture, um, I feel like there are people who are really into comic book characters, mm -hmm. right? Like really into yeah. the characters themselves. But don't know the creators. And then there are people <laughs> who are really into the creators and yes. maybe less interested right. in the characters. Right. Right? So it's, um, it can sometimes feel like a kind of dual Definitely. thing. Yeah. And um, what I appreciate about your book is that it has attention to both. And that kind of dual attention is even encoded in, in your title, My Captain America. Um, and so this is kind of a two-part question. Um, I was hoping that maybe for some audience members who might not be as familiar as others with one or either of these sides of the coin, if you wouldn't mind sort of talking about the significance of, of Joe Simon, you know, in culture today, and then maybe you know, in your thinking, the significance of the character, Captain America. Yeah, well, I mean, part of the reason for wanting to publish the book was the hope that more people would learn who Joe Simon is, because right. he definitely um, flew under the radar more so than Jack Kirby or obviously Stan Lee. Um, and, you know, I've I've definitely annoyed plenty of people in the supermarket at you know, when I got to a point uh, where the sightings didn't upset me so much where I would walk up to people and say, oh, I like your shirt, but do you know who created <laughs> Captain America? And a lot of them would say Stan Lee. And, um, you know, obviously I corrected them. But yeah, I realized how... I, as a granddaughter and being proud of the work that he did and loving him so much, there was a huge part of me that wanted to publish this book that not only um, commemorated our relationship, but also said to the world like, hey, Joe Simon was a huge um, part of the foundation of comic book history. Absolutely, and, um, yeah. So it, it is strange to see the character so popular and in the mainstream and know that like a very small percentage of people who love the movies or, you know, I often wonder the actors in the movies, <laughs> like, do they even know? So. Well, there's this amazing scene in the book, again, I don't want to give anything away, where, where you have a sort of like almost moment yeah. with the famous Hollywood actor, Chris Evans, who plays... Steve yeah. Rogers slash Captain America on the red carpet, right? Yeah. Or, well, or at a party. No, he was, the, oh, the one that was rude to me? Yes. <laughs> that, no, Chris Evans was very nice. Oh, okay, my bad. Okay, I'm sorry, Chris Evans. <laughs> very lovely. Um, I'm sorry, no, Chris Evans. No. Somebody, somebody. Yeah, I didn't name, I was going to, and I was like, you know what, I'm not going to name him. Okay, but, um, sorry I brought that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Put it in laughs> <my mouth. laughs> um, yeah, no, we sort of, the, the, all the grandkids went to the premiere of the first movie and we kind of walked around there like, uh, like we own the place. You know, we were very excited to see all the celebrities that we, you know, made sure to let everyone know. Right. Like, <laughs> do you know why you're in this movie? Because this guy created, you know. Right. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Well, I'm actually really dying to ask you, um, about the Captain America number one cover, which has become so iconic. And then I'm also interested in asking sort of other questions about the amazing work that Joe Simon did that comes up in the book. Um, but I mean, there's so many good stories associated with the cover of Captain America number one, which is cover dated in comic speak um, in March, 1941. Right. So before the U.S. enters the war in December 1941, mm -hmm. um, could you just describe this this cover, which was a collaboration with Jack Kirby, um, for people who might not know it um, yeah. or know that they know it? Well, I'd be surprised if you don't know it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's Captain America punching Hitler in the face, 
um, which as you mentioned, happening before the United States even entered the war was huge. Um, and it definitely put Jack and Daddy Joe's safety at risk. There were surprisingly, you know, I was surprised to learn this after research, researching or reading his book more. Um, there were a lot of Nazi sympathizers at the time. Um, they would hold rallies at Madison Square Garden with thousands of people. So for them to release this cover um, was a huge statement and they definitely got threats at the office. They had to have police officers standing out front. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I, I see it now. It's like used as a meme. The cover is used as a meme for 4th of July now. Wow, uh, I didn't I love. know that. I'm not yeah. very happy. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> neither of them. Uh, it's like, happy 4th of July. Here's Hitler getting punched in the face or something like that. I mean, uh, it's, it's amazing. I, yeah. I, I think you mentioned in your book, I, I forget exactly, but didn't Fiorella LaGuardia, the yeah. mayor in 1941 of New York City, like personally um, send protection to the office? Well, he called, um, my grandfather has a story that he called the office um, to say that apparently he was a huge comic book fan. So he, he wanted to speak to them and uh, thank them and say, don't worry. I have your back. I'm sending some officers. Um, I would feel quite comforted by that. <laughs> I, I know. Um, there's also this amazing detail that um, you mentioned, which is that their editor um, at, at Timely Comics, right? Timely Comics, which then became yeah. Marvel Comics, right. was worried that Hitler would be assassinated before the yeah. cover could come out. Right. So there was this Only. huge rush. Right. <laughs> Right. Wow. So interesting. Yeah. So I think they got a huge team of people together. I think Daddy Joe was the ringleader for all of it. And they were just, that was like worst case scenario that he would be killed before, but they left out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they got it out. Worst case scenario for them. Right. Exactly. In a larger historical sense. Right. Um, so you mentioned just now um, your grandfather's own book. So as as far as I know, he wrote a memoir called My Life in Comics, yep. and then also this really great book called um, The Comic Book Makers, right? Yep. Yep. Speaking of people who are interested in creators. Um, yeah. So about his more sort of straight up memoir, um, how do you feel like your memoir sits in relationship to his own memoir? Could you tell a little bit about his book? Yeah, I mean, having his book was amazing for me you know there are stories that I heard personally um, but to be able to have something to reference and you know I think I could have done interviews with other industry experts as well but I really wanted it to just be from his words and how lucky am I that he wrote a book um, so, you know, and I tell people all the time, I'm by no means an expert and I don't know the ins and outs of the industry. Um, so to have his firsthand account was extremely helpful. So I obviously didn't pull everything from the book, but what I did was find the things that maybe had more influence on my life later on. Um, you know, for instance, I write about when I get my first boyfriend and I start dating and, or meeting my husband and I tie that into his creation of uh, romance comics. Um, so I had to sort of figure out a thread between our two lives and his past and his career and how I could tie that with my memoir thread because at the heart of the book, it's a memoir, it's my coming of age story. Um, so yeah, I mean, I very, very lucky to, that he wrote that book and he published that, uh, the year that he died, it was, I think in the spring. Yeah. I noticed, I noticed that published in 2011, yeah. um, the same year he died. That's, yeah. that's amazing. And he was yeah. so proud of it. I mean, he was an artist and he, but he always wanted to make it clear that he was a writer. 
Mm -hmm. So I think every book that he published, he was just like so excited. And I remember him just holding it in his, you know, he had his one recliner chair that he was his favorite. Um, I was falling apart and disgusting, but it was his <laughs> favorite. But I remember him just sitting there holding his book, just so proud of it. Um, and he let me serve as a consulting editor on that book because he, he knew I wanted to get into the publishing that, you know, writer or whatever. Um, but even that was just really helpful because I would get chapters and read everything before it was put out. So I kind of learned a lot in that process as well. Right. Um, so you mentioned romance comics and I mean, maybe, maybe I should just throw, throw this out as a general question and then um, maybe ask a follow-up, but would you describe for, for people who might not know all of the different areas in which you worked? You know, you mentioned art and writing, but in yeah. terms of different genres, could you just sort of tell us, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's amazing that he created these enduring superheroes and also basically created the genre of romance comics. Right, which I mean, was hugely <laughs> popular. And I don't know if a lot, of, my, the last talk I did um, with Pals, um, I had, Jackie Nodell, who's an expert with the romance comics. Um, and I was happy to put some focus on that as well, because obviously Captain America is very well known and popular. And, um, but yeah, the romance comics were hugely popular when they came out. They sold millions of copies. Um, as for the other, I mean, he, God, he did everything. I mean, his first, his very first comic was a Western. Um, you know, there were some crime mystery sort of comic books. And that was during the time, I think, I think he mentioned this in his book that during the um, Comics Code Authority in the 50s, there's a picture of, I don't know if it was in the courtroom or something, but there's a picture of someone holding up one of his comic books <laughs> as like evidence of how awful, uh, you know, this is going to ruin children. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and he also, so he, he got into advertising as well, which was sort of his steady paycheck. Um, the comic book business was not very stable. Um, it kind of came in bursts. So he did advertising as well. Uh, yeah. And didn't he also um, work in satire and humor comics? Yes. Um, <laughs> so he did Sick Magazine. Um, and it was a spinoff. And, I, you know, I'm going to say kind of a bite off of Mad, but like he admitted it was 100% a bite off of Mad. And he, they didn't care. <laughs> like, that's fine. Yeah. And they were always hoping that they would get sued by Mad. Why? Just, just for like publicity. Like if they oh, got yeah. sued, it would get them publicity. But <laughs> I think they were, I think his last name is Gaines who, um, with Mad. But yes. they said he, he, they were friendly and he was making enough money off of Mad that he would never bother doing it. He would never bother suing them. So, but right. they tried, they kept trying to <laughs> annoy him, but... So do you know what genre he liked working in best? So I mean, he, I mean, this is so interesting thinking about comics and storytelling. You know, he did Westerns, he did superheroes, he did romance comics, he did satire comics and all sorts of other stuff too. Um, do you know what he was most drawn to or was it just he could work across genres? I think he loved it all. I mean, there was something you know, as, when he was older and he was trying to create new characters, it was usually a superhero. Yeah, right. That um, comes up in your book. Yeah. Um, but with like the humor stuff, he was so funny. He was just hilarious. So I think a part of him really enjoyed that. Um, and I know he enjoyed the romance comics too, because he would answer questions under the guise of someone named Nancy Hale. <laughs> um, and I think he enjoyed doing that as well, which I always say, like, that would not fly today if you ever tried to do that. But. I, I absolutely love um, his romance comics. I mean, I, like, wish there were more of them. I could just read them forever. Um, I think they're so 
Great. And there's, there's this anecdote in your story that I really love where I think he is describing to you seeing his own parents together collaborate on mm -hmm. writing a story about how they met to send into the magazine True Confessions. Yeah. Right. So to oh. me that read like sort of like a primal romance comic scene or something. Yeah. Yeah. And it was also very inspiring for him to see them working so hard at something artistic. Yeah. Um, because he, he always knew that's what he wanted to do. I mean, since he was, he was a small boy, he was selling little drawings at school um, as a kid. And he mentions in his book, seeing his parents so dedicated to this one project really sparked something in him. And it's funny, you know, watching him when I was a kid um, be successful as an artist and take it seriously, spark something in me as well. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, it seemed, I was gonna ask um, how you were inspired as a writer by, by his work, you know, as an artist and a writer. Could you yeah. say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it was just, um, you know, you're always a little bit insecure in your dream of being an artist in whichever form. I always knew I wanted to be a writer, uh, but I always knew that wasn't a very stable <laughs> uh, way to live. Um, so seeing him make it his life and his career, uh, maybe put a false <laughs> sense of <laughs> confidence in me. Maybe it wasn't a great thing. Um, Seems to have turned out okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm grateful to, I had a lot of artists in my family and he was obviously the most well-known and most successful. Um, but I do feel very lucky to have that. And I'm sure it inspired me in some way to even want to do something artistic. I mean, that was, I thought that's just what you do. That's, you know, um, and it was, he was just so creative in so many ways. And it wasn't just with the drawing and he painted and it was just in regular life with his video camera doing family videos. And he would start directing us and make up movies. And he was a kid at heart in many ways, which I think helped form such a strong bond with him when I was a child. Right. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to ask you about that because that, of course, is a huge part of your book, um, is sort of your family development, and this is taking place in New York City, and you grew up in a one-bedroom apartment that seemed to be getting smaller and smaller with the addition of siblings, yeah. um, and you really found his apartment a kind of retreat. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what it was like growing up and how the two of you became so close, you know, just from a, a personal point of view, yeah. like from a family point of view. Yeah. I mean, it started very, very early. My mom would drop me off at his apartment a lot um, when I was maybe four or five even, just so she could run errands and, you know, do things without a kid hanging off of her. Um, so I was there and I found comfort in his apartment even that early because the city in the 80s was very volatile and you know I, I saw things that as a child frightened me. I mean as an adult it would probably frighten people you know people getting mugged or um, people with needles coming up subway stairs and his just going into his apartment sort of made the world stop for a moment. And it was just, you know, from his window, you could see the city buildings and the skyline, and it almost made the city seem magical to me. Um, yeah. And he loved New York. He was obsessed with New York. I mean, since he was a kid, he wanted to move there. So, you know, I came from my small apartment in this crazy city and I would go be with him and I could just feel that um, 
admiration for the city and and he was just so welcoming and warm and he let me do whatever I, you know, he let me eat all the crappy food I wanted. He'd, <laughs> you know, buy me soda. I wasn't allowed to have soda at home. But uh, as I got older and the siblings came and I became a moody teenager <laughs> and uh, it was definitely more of an escape for me at that point that I really needed just for my mental health and happiness. Um, you know, the, it was a time when I didn't feel like I belonged in my apartment. There was a newborn when I was 17 and a six year old. And I just felt like I was in the way a lot of the time. And I never ever felt that way with him. You know, he may very well have been like, oh my God, she's here again. Like get her out of here, but he never showed it. and. Um, I'm so lucky that I had him living. He was 40 blocks south of us. Um, he was so close. And I, I know how lucky I am to not only have had that proximity to him, but to be the first grandchild of the family right. and sort of get that additional time with him. Right. Um, there's a great um, story in your book that I really love about you being a teenager and going out to a show with your friends and drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. And then it's like, what do you want to do at the end of the night? You yeah. want to go to your grandfather's house. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really so touching. lame. I love it. No, it's, <laughs> no, I know. it's wonderful. I love it. Um, yeah. I, I just want to ask you one last question and then I feel like we should open it up yeah. um, to Q&A from the wider audience. Um, and that's just sort of, you know, I'm looking at the cover of your book as we're talking. Um, it's a question about superheroes and, and gender because you have this great cover with this, it yeah. looks like an outline of a woman and then these, this sort of um, the visual signs of Captain America sort of um, in her shape. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you as a, as a woman feeling connected to, to Captain America and other, other male superheroes or, or how do you feel like that yeah. might have changed recently in culture? You know, I feel like there's plenty of women who love comics and love superheroes in the world. I think where it started to feel um, difficult was in the publishing process and actually writing a book about a coming of age story, you know, where I, I talk about getting my period and getting pregnant and falling in love. And, you know, there's this very female oriented storyline. Um, and then we have Captain America on the front and in the title. And I think it was, it was definitely hard to sell the book because I don't think publishers really knew who are, who are we going to market this to, right? Like that's the main question is how are we going to market this? Um, so I'm obviously very grateful that Pegasus saw that, you know, this could be a cohesive book and that it meant something. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of the time people will, you know, if they share the book on Facebook or whatever, they say, if you're a fan of Captain America, you should read this book. And of course, 100%, because that was one of his greatest creations. And I, I want people to know that. But at the same time, I'm like, but it's also, like, <laughs> it's also a memoir. Like, do you like memoir? Do you, you know, um, you know, stories about New York City in the 80s and the 90s. And, and honestly, just like bare bone universal theme is just losing somebody who you love. And finding them in the world and how do you do that and how do you carry on after they die and where do you find them um, which I think a lot of people can relate to so um, well thank you so much and maybe on on that note um, we'll turn it over to Marisa for the um, Q&A thank you thank you all right thank you both that was a great discussion um, we have several questions in the Q&A, um, but people can please feel free to continue putting questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen if you have any questions at this point. Um, but we'll start off with a question a couple of people asked actually, which is, 
which chapter or part of the book do you think your grandfather would have enjoyed or appreciated the most? Ooh, Ooh that's a tough one. Um, Cause obviously he would just be very proud of the whole thing. <laughs> um, I don't know, probably just the scenes where I'm in, you know, there's, there's one where I'm older and I just start dating and he's sort of questioning me about who I'm dating and asking, you know, is he Jewish? You know, um, just, I, I would like to think that those moments where it was just the two of us in his apartment um, would mean something to him and he would enjoy reading. Um, or, I mean, he never got to meet my children. So, you know, maybe the chapters where I have my daughter and I don't know, that's a hard, it's a hard call, but um, the conventions, the scene, you know, the scenes of the conventions, I think he would really enjoy as well. Cause he loved, that was like his happy place was at comic conventions. He made it to one the two months before he died. And uh. I mean, they pushed him in, in a wheelchair and he was totally anti wheelchair. Like he did not like admitting weakness saying that I need a wheelchair and he did it. Um, it was for his birthday too and they all sing happy birthday to him there's a video on youtube and it makes me cry every time <laughs> um, anyway can i piggyback on that question yeah. um you mentioned um your grandfather asking you if your boyfriend was jewish mm -hmm. and that reminded me he has this great line if i'm not butchering it that you quote him saying in the book where he says he wants to live with the goys and be buried with the yids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I feel like sort of Jewishness was sort of like a light theme in the background, yeah. but I was wondering yeah. if you could explain that quote or, or what was important to him about being Jewish. If it was, yeah, it was more the culture of it. Um, he, his parents were very religious growing up and it sort of scared him off of it a little bit. Um, but it was very important to him, too. I mean, I'm, you know, asking if my boyfriend is Jewish and, you know, I married a Jewish man and I know he's smiling down at me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, he wasn't religious, um, but just the culture and there was, a, there was a lot of pride with being Jewish, even though he wasn't religious. I mean, he punched Hitler in the face. Right. <laughs> Thank you yep. for letting me piggyback. <laughs> um, okay, so another question we got was, um, was there anything that surprised you throughout the process of writing the book? Um, I think the things that surprised me were looking back at how I felt as a child and really digging into that. And, you know, I always said I loved him as a child, but I went even deeper into it. And I remembered being scared of loving him. Um, I was just, it sort of hit me at one point, he went to the hospital because um, he swallowed a chicken bone and it punctured his stomach, uh, which is just so something he would do. Um, and just seeing him in the hospital sparked something in me. I was like, oh my God he could die. Like, and I had never even considered that as a child because I didn't have a lot of experience with losing people. And from that moment on, I was just very nervous about loving him so much. And really from that day on, I was sort of always in my head, like he's going to die one day and you better prepare yourself. Um, and obviously you can't prepare yourself. Yeah. Um, Right. Uh, someone asked, uh, while writing the book, did you delve heavily into the work through reading or supplemental research, or were you more interested in dealing specifically with your experience and memories of him? It was more my experience and memories with him, but also, as I mentioned, um, reading his memoir and reading about his career and his work through his own words. Um, that was really important to me. And I'm sure there's people who would read his memoir and think, well, I don't think that's how it happened. Or, you know, the story of Spider-Man and 
you know, silver spider and what came first and, you know, did Stanley really see a fly on the wall and that, you know, there, I think it can get very messy in the comic book industry just with so much creativity and ideas and I didn't really want to get too deep into that. I just wanted to focus on um, his memories and how he remembered it. That makes sense. Um, okay, is there a chapter that stands out to you as one you had to revise the most? And if so, why? Um, no, I think they all, they all got revised easily. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, like I can say the one that was revised the least was um, when he died. The, the day that I got the call that he was in the hospital and that this was it. Um, because that just flew out of me very easily. Like I had been in my stewing in it for so many years that it just shot out. And the other ones, you know, dealing with childhood and my teenage years, I really had to like think hard and go back to that and watch home videos of him and remember again, like things he said, and his jokes and that sort of thing. But um, the like heaviest grief was just, it was there. Yeah. Alternatively, what part of the book brought you the most joy to write? Hmm. I think the end, which is strange because the very end is very heavy emotionally too. Um, but it's sort of like my reckoning with New York and him not being there. And I wrote it, the scene that I'm writing about is I actually lived it in November. So it was like the last thing that I wrote and I forced myself to go back to his building, um, which I couldn't even go into the neighborhood since he died. Um, and I forced myself, you know, I knew I was writing the book and I said, I think it's time that I get myself there and just deal with it and process it. And I did it and it was very hard, but I feel like I came out of it stronger. And um, I don't think I would have done that if I wasn't writing the book. So I'm happy about that. Um, it's so nice in that part of the book too, that you mentioned that the doorman tells you that people in the building have continued to talk about him mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah, the other so, doorman kind of yeah. since he passed away. Yeah, he was new. Um, he said, oh, who's your grandfather? And I told him and yeah, he said that the other guys who worked there still talked about him. And you know, it's the same thing with those comic book fans when I meet like a big comic book fan and they know who Joe Simon is. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. That's great. Um, someone wants to know, growing up, did your grandfather ever discuss his ideas or process with you? He did discuss his ideas and I always felt very <laughs> guilty because I didn't feel like I was worthy or like, who was I to like give my opinion? So he would show me a recreation or, you know, say, what about this character? And I'd be like, it's good. Like, I didn't know <laughs> what to say. And I always felt really guilty. Um, but I know now like how lucky I was to see these early uh, creations of his. And um, it's very strange to, you know, there's still artwork of his that might be in like auction sites and to see it out there sort of orbiting in the universe without a home is very strange. Um, so I do, I love when some people email me and say, oh, I, I got this great piece of your grandfather's and it's hanging on my wall and that always makes me feel really nice. Great. Um, Okay, uh, how would you describe your grandfather's relationship with fame? He wasn't interested in it, really. Um, you know, he loved meeting fans and he loved talking about the comic book industry. Um, 
a lot of the times when I went over there when I was younger, there was a collector or another artist. He always had somebody over, which pissed me off when I was a kid because I was like, he's mine. Like, this is my time. Get out of here. Um, but he loved being part of the business, but he was never, you know, and there were times when I, I would say, well, what about Spider-Man? Like, wasn't that really your idea? Like, I would try and like push him to like want the spotlight more, I guess, because I was so proud of him and I wanted him to go for it. Um, and he would just always sort of be like, no, nah, nah, you know, like he, he wasn't interested in that at all. Okay, and um, let's see. Um, sorry, <laughs> we just got a new question that's a little longer. So um, this person asks, inspired by my brother and the trivia question I just directed at him, he's a huge Captain America fan, who did know that Joe Simon is co-creator. He also knew that many comic creators seem to become easily separated from the characters and work they created. So as a scholar of comics and comic history, Hillary, do you find this to be common? Um, yes, I mean, I, I feel like um, this situation is getting better now, but I think um, there is a big issue in the comic book industry with so-called work for hire, yes. right? So, I mean, in the sort of golden age of comics, I mean, it's just worth saying, you know, Captain America basically um, launched Marvel big time, right? You know, it was called something different then, but that, that launched the culture that we're dealing with today. And a lot of those, you know, legends like Joe Simon, you know, Megan mentioned, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, you know, we know about them. But, but currently, you know, there's a whole bunch of people who work on various um, sides of putting out, you know, a comic book, you know, either as writers, pencilers, inkers, artists of some kind, colorists. And it's a work for hire situation in which we often don't know their name and, or, you know, they don't get a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. And, um, they, their names aren't attached with the character. So I just think that comics is such an interesting industry. There's some sort of superstars that become cultural heroes. And then there are a lot of people, I think, who are struggling for more recognition as artists, however you define artists, um, mm -hmm. across the board. I hope that answers the question a little bit. I think it's a real problem. So, you know, Megan mentions in the book going to the San Diego Comic-Con, um, I've been a few times. The last time I went was in 2016. And at the Eisner Awards, the big topic was how work for hire is a, is a problem in the industry. So I guess I could leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll do one more question. Um, someone would like to know if your grandfather uh, reminisced about working with Jack. Kirby and ever talked about getting back together again. He says the Simon and Kirby brand was a strong one. It was, and they they were very, very close um, during their heyday. Um, they lived across the street. They bought houses across the street from each other. Their families are very close. Um, and I've always been sad that I never got to meet him um, or even one of his grandchildren. Um, you know, I've messaged a few times on social media with his grandson, but I always feel like we're related in some weird way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I heard a lot of stories about him and Jack and the family and the kids running around the yard. Um, but I think they stopped working together a while back um, before he even died. Um, I think it might have been the 70s. I'm, I'm not sure about the, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a while. And um, I think they, they, they had their time and I think they knew that was the end of the road for them. They just were both going in different directions. Um, so we, we appreciate the work they did then and it can never be recreated, but it was, it was good stuff. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you both so much again for this evening and for the excellent conversation. 
Um, thank you to everyone out there for spending your evening with us. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can learn more about this book and purchase My Captain America at the link in the chat. And on behalf of Har Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I just want to say have a good night, keep reading, and be well. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.